Retina Rounds, episode number 172, Submacular Hemorrhage Displacement. Submacular hemorrhage is a vision-threatening complication of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, neovascular age-related macular degeneration, retinal arterial macroaneurysms, and other retinal diseases. Management options include clinic-based pneumatic displacement and surgical displacement. Our very special guest surgeon today is Dr. Abdallah El Aban, Senior Consultant at Spire Hull and East Riding Hospital in the UK. Dr. El Aban shows us a beautiful case of surgical submacular hemorrhage displacement using subretinal TPA, air, and intravitreal anti-VEGF. The anatomic and functional outcomes are truly outstanding. At the end of the case, we will review the pros and cons of pneumatic versus surgical displacement, as well as some potential complications to be aware of. Thank you, Dr. Elaban, for sharing this case. Okay, so here's a fundus photo of our patient. You can see there's a large submacular hemorrhage in the left eye. This patient's vision is hand motions with onset of symptoms 10 days prior. You can see on the OCT there's a large pigment epithelial detachment, as well as an adjacent area of hyperreflective material in the subretinal space consistent with hemorrhage. The treatment options for this case include medical and surgical interventions. Medical therapy includes intravitreal anti-VEGF injections alone, which would be reserved for patients with only mild submacular hemorrhage. For more extensive hemorrhage, as in this case, intravitreal TPA with or without an intravitreal injection of an expansile gas bubble could be considered. Surgical options include pars plane vitrectomy with either intravitreal or subretinal anti-VEGF injection, and either intravitreal TPA, subretinal TPA, or subretinal TPA and air. Let's see what Dr. Elaban does. Okay, so in this point in the surgery, a cataract extraction with lens implantation and a pars plane vitrectomy have already been performed. And Dr. Alaban is now looking at the posterior pole to decide where he wants to inject, and he's also using uh, his preoperative OCT uh, to make that determination. And the blue arrow here is the area where he's going to inject because there's an adjacent uh, area of subretinal fluid, which creates some space for him to inject. Now he's using a 38 gauge subretinal cannula, and this is uh, attached to the machine using a microdose injection kit. Uh, and this allows him to use a viscous fluid mode on the machine to uh, administer or inject the TPA. And typically this is going to be at a low PSI, perhaps 10 to 12 to begin with to initiate the bleb. And once the bleb has been created and lowering the PSI to about anywhere from seven to 10 uh, to slowly um, uh, expand the bubble. So you can see here he's dimpled into the retinal surface. You can see these blue arrows indicating the extent of the uh, subretinal TPA that's being injected now. Uh, important when, uh, when injecting to first dimple in on the retina, uh, allow the subretinal bleb uh, to, uh, to be created, advancing only slightly if you don't see a bleb that's, uh, that's being initiated. And then once the bleb starts, you don't wanna push it any further because you don't want that tip to get into the sub RPE space. Now he's going very slowly here and that's very important. You can see that the, the bubble is slowly expanding uh, beyond uh, the, uh, now towards the fovea and now uh, beyond the uh, infrotemporal arcade. And the reason he's going slowly is because one of the risks of submacular um, uh, injection is potentially uh, the risk of a blowout uh, macular hole. And so now once that, um, that bleb has been created, you can see it's quite an extensive bleb that covers all of the hemorrhage that's in the macula. Dr. Elaban is now going to inject a little bit of submacular air. So you can see again, he's going through the same area where he injected previously, and he's going to very slowly administer some air into the submacular space. And the reason for the air bubble uh, is to A, uh, create a little bit of an air plug so that the, um, the TPA that's in the subretinal space doesn't egress through uh, the retinotomy to create the bleb. Uh, and also the, uh, the buoyancy of the air bubble allows for compression of the TPA against the hemorrhage and also allows for some pneumatic displacement of the hemorrhage inferiorly if the patient's in the upright uh, position. Now once that uh, submacular injection is done, Dr. Elaban is going to perform a partial air fluid exchange, typically anywhere from a half to a third of the uh, vitreous cavity uh, will be exchanged for air. And once that's done, uh, he's just going to uh, inspect the area, make sure uh, that he's happy with both the bleb height as well as the position of the air bubble. Once that's done, the trocars can be removed and the residual air bubble that's in the vitreous cavity is now being exchanged for a non-expansile concentration of SF6 gas. 
Now there are some options here. Some surgeons prefer to put in a shorter acting gas bubble. Other surgeons prefer just leaving the eye air filled. So it'll be up to the surgeon to decide what their preference is. Now once the air gas exchange has been performed, the trocars are removed. And now Dr. Elaban is injecting into the vitreous cavity uh, some anti-VEGF medication via 30 gauge needle. Another option here would be to inject the uh, anti-VEGF medication along with the TPA into the submacular space. Now here's the patient one week after surgery. You can see that uh, there's a, a superior gas bubble and there's some dispersed vitreous hemorrhage uh, inferior to that gas. Now here's the patient three weeks after surgery. You can see on the fundus photo that the submacular hemorrhage has largely been displaced, save for a small area of submacular hemorrhage in the nasal macula. And on the OCT, you can see that things have improved considerably. The submacular hemorrhage has largely uh, gone away, and the pigment epithelial detachment height appears to be lower than it was preoperatively. Now here's the patient six weeks after surgery. The submacular hemorrhage uh, has almost in, uh, entirely been displaced. And now you can see on the OCT only very trace amounts of hyperreflective material in the subretinal space and a, a lower, um, shallower PED. Now here's uh, both fluorescein angiography and ICG angiography for this patient. You can see in the early frames of the fluorescein angiogram, there's some window defect and some leakage in the later frames of the, of the fluorescein angiogram. On the ICG, you can see small polyp-like lesions uh, in the area of leakage. Uh, that persist in, that are present in the early uh, stages of the of the ICG angiogram and persist later, which is highly suggestive of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So now you can see the patient at 10 and 12 weeks. The uh, pigment epithelial detachment has largely uh, settled down, uh, and the submacular hemorrhage uh, has uh, completely dissipated. And here's the progression of the patient from pre-op uh, to 12 weeks, and then uh, six months after surgery. Uh, baseline vision hand motion, the patient improved all the way up to uh, approximately the level of 20-30 vision with a, a tremendous uh, restoration of the uh, normal anatomy in the macula. Okay, so here are some take-home points. Now, in previously in episode 67, we've discussed some general principles of submacular hemorrhage displacement, as well as a safe dosing of TPA. If you haven't already, be sure to check out that episode. Here I'd like to dive a bit deeper into pneumatic displacement, which is a less invasive clinic-based approach versus surgical submacular displacement. Now in this retrospective study by Simon Zato and colleagues, the anatomic and functional outcomes of patients undergoing pneumatic displacement using intravitreal gas with or without TPA and anti-VEGF were compared to patients undergoing surgical displacement with a submacular injection of a cocktail of 50 micrograms of TPA in 0.4 milliliters 0.05 milliliters of either a flibercept or ranibizumab, and 0.2 milliliters of filtered air, with a partial vitreous cavity air fluid exchange and implantation of isoexpansile SF6. Now, patients undergoing surgical displacement were more likely to have hemorrhage from neovascular AMD, were more likely to have larger and more extensive submacular hemorrhage, and a longer mean duration of symptoms, about 10 and a half days for the surgery group versus five and a half days for the pneumatic group. Patients undergoing surgical displacement were more likely to have complete foveal and macular hemorrhage displacement. However, when we look at visual outcomes, we see that postoperative vision improved in both groups throughout the postoperative period. Vision was significantly better than baseline in both groups through six months post-op, and this persisted through uh, post-op month 12 in the pneumatic group, but was not significantly improved from baseline in the surgical group at post-op month 12. Now, this, this difference may in part be due to the more severe baseline pathology of patients in the surgical group. Postoperative complications were not significantly different between the two groups. It should be noted that recurrent submacular hemorrhage was seen more often in the surgical group. Salvage surgical displacement was required in 20% of the pneumatic patients, and reoperation was required in 12% of the surgical displacement patients. Retinal detachment was seen in both groups with about a 9% risk in the surgical displacement group. Now, given these outcomes and risks, the authors suggest a stepwise approach to submacular hemorrhage displacement, starting first with pneumatic displacement in patients with smaller submacular hemorrhage or recent onset of symptoms, and proceeding to surgical displacement for cases of failed pneumatic displacement, more extensive submacular hemorrhage, or patients with delayed presentation. 
This higher rate of retinal detachment with surgical displacement of submacular hemorrhage was also reported this year by Dr. Jordan Safran, Jason Sue, and colleagues at the Wells Eye Hospital. They also found about a 9% risk of retinal detachment. Now, of those patients with a retinal detachment, 80% were macula off and 60% had PVR. The single surgery success rate was 70% and the final anatomic success rate was 92%. Mean preoperative vision prior to any intervention and mean final vision were very poor in this group of patients that developed retinal detachment. The risk of retinal detachment as well as the risk of macular hole formation should be discussed with any patient undergoing surgical displacement. And nonetheless, anatomic and functional outcomes can be quite impressive as was demonstrated by Dr. Elaban, and fortunately his patient did extremely well. Again, we want to thank Dr. Elaban for sharing this case and for giving us all an opportunity to learn more about submacular hemorrhage displacement. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.